I'm here with Charlie Yositi, one of the foremost historians on the Q Games regarding Willie Moscone's career and basically about his 526 ball run in 1954 on a 4x8 runs with table. Hi Charlie, how are you? Okay, Bill. Good. Okay, so talk about what you might want to say in regarding Willie. Well, when Willie went out to do an exhibition, he played on whatever table was available. And debating anything about his 526 run, you know, agitates me. He went to a place they had a 4 by 8 table. And they're going to tell you that the pockets were this size and the pockets were that size. Well, he couldn't choose what table he wanted to play on. What was the condition of the table? Was it new cloth or was it old cloth? Were the rods good? Did, did they respond properly with the balls, centennial balls? Nobody, I don't know if anybody really knows the answers except Willie, and he's not here to defend himself. Willie once told me that it was easier to run balls on a 5 by 10 table than a 4 by 8 because the balls spread open more. That's why normally they, they play half the table on 90% of their shots, as you well know. And you know as an exhibition player, you walk into a room, they hired you, and unless you were the great really hobby, you couldn't demand what kind of table, what kind of cloth, what kind of balls. You played on what was ever there. This is true. Right? This is true. Okay. And so, I played on some horrible okay, tables, right. too. <laughs> Willie did what he had to do every single time. Now, after Willie passed, I went to the BCA Trinity Show in New Orleans with his son, Bill Jr., Willie Jr. And we walked around, and people were coming up to him saying, Mr. Moscone, your father played for me, and I had a room in Detroit in 1954, and he went 150 and out. And we went another 50 feet, and someone else was going to say, I had a room in uh, New Orleans, and your dad came in, did two exhibitions, ran 150 and both games. And this went on for four days. And I said, Unbelievable. Did this guy ever not run 150 an hour? And it's sure he didn't, but he did it more times than not, especially in exhibitions. Now, everybody's going to talk about the 526. When he ran 300 plus on a 5 by 10 on four and a half inch pockets, nobody seems to challenge that. Crane did it. He ran 309. Greenwood ran 200, I think, in 72. So mm -hmm. they did what they had to do, what was ever there. If they're doing an exhibition and it's four and a half inch pockets, you run balls on a four and a half inch pocket. If it's five and a half inch pockets, you run balls on a five and a half inch pocket. If it's a five by ten, a four and a half by nine, a four by eight, you do what you have to do as a professional. You know, I once asked Raymond Coolman, how do you think Hoppy would have done today? He said, the sign of a true professional is you adjust to whatever conditions are there. And, yep. and that's what I think the great players of the past did. You know, you have to remember, I don't know who's writing what, how great a player they are, how great they think they are, but I'd be willing to bet that they never won a professional tournament with the caliber of players that Willie played with today. Today, if you had the entry fee, you go into a double elimination tournament. He played a round-robin tournament from 1933 to 1955 with the same players, Erwin Rudolph, Ralph Greenleaf, Andrew Ponzi, Jimmy Karras, Babe Cranefield, Greenleaf, Anofio Lurie, Irving Crane, uh, whoever was the greatest players at the time, they played. There wasn't a double elimination where Paul Smith, Charlie Yossetti, or Joe Dope walked in with $600, laid it down, and they played, and it was double elimination. You had to face the greatest players in the world every day. Tournament. That's the way it was in three cushion years ago too, Charlie. Not anymore. Right. I mean, you, you played in, in the tournaments today. I mean, uh, to get to get into a national tournament, you had to qualify. That, always. You have to, have, you have to have the money. Always. You have the money. <coughs> you play. Yeah. You, you pay your twenty-five dollar uh, dues fees, and now you remember you remember at the USBA. And they're running a qualifier in Florida or at Karen Cafe or in uh, Derby City Classic. And you go and you pay your $350 entry fee and you're playing in a national tournament. Right. You didn't earn your way. You earned the money to play in the tournament. 
what a lot of people don't even know, and I was interviewed about this several times before. In 1979, when I was doing the promotions, the Great Pool Shootout, which was really in fact, I started to add other players. We did the first one in 1978 on Valentine's Day at the Waldorf Story in New York City. The next year, we went out to the Hilton in Vegas, and I brought along six young players that happened to be Steve Mizorak, Alan Hopkins, Pete Margo, Mike Siegel, Jim Rempe, and I believe the only, and May Martin. We had them out there playing trick shots and was mostly trick shots. And that was the first time Siegel was on television. And I remember Howard Cosell asked him his name, and he was so nervous he didn't know his name. <laughs> eventually, Mike snapped out of it How and he performed very well. There was a press conference, and everyone was in attendance. After the press conference, Willie told me, would you stay with me? I want to practice. Whack the ball. So this is fine. So we started to play nine ball. And I was playing with him, and, you know, he was... His break wasn't the greatest break in the world, but if he made a ball on the break, he could just sit down, and that was history. So we played for about a half hour, and he says, no, would you rack some straight pool for me, because I, it's going to help me get in stroke. I says, fine. So I racked the ball, he says, make the best break shot you could make. And by a miracle of God, I played what I thought was a great break shot, and I left him almost in the jaws of the pocket, the lower left-hand pocket. He looks at the, the rack, Walks around, she walks up, looks again, looks again, and calls some ball out of the rack. Bang, it goes in. Eleven racks later, eleven racks later, he says, let's get some coffee. Leave the balls where they are. I says, okay. So I call room service, and they bring coffee. Fourteen racks later, which is now 25 racks, he says, let's get a sandwich. What do you want to eat? I never forgot this. He says, they got good deli in here. What do you like? I said, I don't know, I like uh, pastrami. He okay, you get the pastrami, I'll get corned beef, and we'll split them. So he goes back in, and he starts again. 26 racks, 27 racks, 28 racks, 30 racks. Pete Margo walks in. Petey watches him shoot about five racks in. He says, Jesus, he's in dead stroke. I don't think anybody could beat him right now, I regardless of who they are or what their age is. He says, what is he going to run up? I says, 35 racks. He says, what? He stays a while and leaves. On the 42nd rack, he leaves a perfect break shot. He says, I'm tired. Wham! And he fires the ball in. He runs 589 balls. And That's I'll amazing. And I'll take the lie detector test with my head in the guillotine if anybody thinks I'm lying. So he's wow. talking about That's phenomenal. 26 his 526 was nothing. He ran 589. I was privileged to be there. Petey walked in and saw a part of the run. And the guy, at that time, it's 1979, so he's 66 years old. <laughs> wow. And this was on a Brunswick 4.5 by 9, right? That was a 4.5 by 9 go kart. Okay. Amazing. Standard pockets, whatever the standard pockets are, five inch, four inch, three quarter, whatever they were. There was nothing shim, there was nothing to my knowledge. It was just a table of runs with the supply, and, and that was it. Wow. But the, what's phenomenal to me is the stories of when everybody is telling you he ran 150 and out, he ran 150 and out, he ran 150 and out. A great story, Lou Gutierrez told me, was Lou went to, they were having the World Tournament in. Uh, the Commodore Hotel in New York in the 60s. I don't remember if it was. They did it from 63 to 68. And at one of these tournaments, Lou went, and he meets Frank Paradise, the great cue maker. And they, they're BSing, and Frank has a cue with him, and he says, well, where are you going, Lou? He says, I'm going to go watch Willie really do an exhibition at whoever it was. It could have been Julian's, Ames. I, I don't remember where Lou told me it was. And he said, could you do me a favor? I made this cue for Willie. Could you... Uh, give it to him for me, you know, with my compliments. He said, sure. So Lou goes over to wherever the exhibition is, and Lou is going to do an, an afternoon and evening exhibition. So he walks in, he, he greets him, and he says, hello, you know, and he says, and Lou, he says, Frank Paradise asked me to give you this cue. Would you mind trying it out so you like it? So Lou unwraps the cue, and 
Lou says he was very meticulous about the tips and he worked on the tips for a little while. He hits a few boards. He got played the exhibition with him. And he runs 131 in the first game. <laughs> the second game, he runs 147. Wow. Lou says, how do you like the kills? Lou tells him, really, how do you like the kills? It's not bad. <laughs> I guess the, the shooting said enough as it was, right? Yeah, that was, you know, that was it. But, I mean, it was just phenomenal. I mean, I watched him run hundreds and just stop for no, no apparent reason. He got tired. And this is an old man. God only knows what he did as, as a youth. Now, I, I'll tell you a fact that a lot of people don't know. In his first world tournament he won, it was called Leaf Play. They took... I believe it was eight players. They had to play each other 16 times. They played eight home in home matches. And the players were, uh, really didn't play. Ponzi, Karras, Anofrio, Laurie. It could have been Johnny Irish. Anyway, it, it, it's on my website. Players of the Willie era. Played, Willie played, the best players of, of that time. Willie played 208 games. He ran a hundred plus balls. Listen to this: a hundred plus balls every eleventh game. Wow! Calculated it out. Let's forget about seventies, eighties, nineties. A hundred and plus balls every eleventh game. He had several perfect games. There was one game where he scratched on the break, so he had his minus two, and he ran one hundred and twenty-seven and out. He ran one hundred twenty-six and out, one hundred and twenty-five and out. Eight times doing that. That's amazing. Plus the other runs of numerous runs, over 20 runs of 100. I mean, that, that's not like human. In his challenge matches, I asked Jimmy Karras at one of the legendary tournaments we did up at the Concord. I asked every player the same question. And the players were Joe Balsas, Karras Crane, Jimmy Moore, UJ Puckett, and uh, Fatty, who were the greatest players you ever played? Who was the toughest player? And everyone answered Willie. Because Fatty, you know, wasn't a tournament player. But everyone else answered Willie, except Karras. Karras says, I have to answer two ways. He says, go ahead. He says, one individual tournament game, I would have picked Greenleaf. Because Karras was the oldest and played against Greenleaf in 1929 until Greenleaf quit in 1946. So Greenleaf was actually barred by Brunswick from playing in the tournament because of his uh, drunkenness or... His illness. Daylight or whatever, <laughs> whatever he caught, yeah. But uh, Brunswick banned actually Johnny Layton and uh, Greenleaf. But anyway, Carlos answers is out there answer two ways. One match in a tournament one game, I would pick Greenleaf because he had a better temperament. He says, well, he was a little hot-headed. He says, in a long match, Marsconi would kill you with hundreds. That was Karras' words to me. And when he played Karras in 1946, where they played in 10 cities across the United States, he beats Karras, who's at that time three or four-time world champion. 6,300 to 3,200 to 3,000 or some ridiculous two to one. Score. Almost two to one, yeah. One day, one day, Willie just killed him. One day, I think in Kansas City, Willie in, in four sessions ran 125 and out because they were playing in a 5 by 10. Uh, three out of the four matches that they played. I mean, that's not human. That's just not human. How does anyone dominate a sport? Not even the great Willie Hoppy. Winning your first title in 1940, and your last one in 1958. In the only two years that he didn't win, he challenged for the title and won it back. 1940. 1942, he, he didn't like the way the tournament went. Him, uh, Erwin Rudolph, and Crane were all tied at 8-3. They took the top three players and they played a round robin with the three players and they all went one and one. They eliminated Willie on ball count. <clears throat> he said, if they would have counted ball count, I would have won the tournament. Which, again, if you look at my records, 
It's there. He wouldn't want on ball count. But they were gone by one lost record. He says, so they eliminated me. And Willie was mad. So Rudolph beats Crane in 1942. Crane comes back, wins the title in 42. And Willie wins the tournament in, 42, in 43. In 42, later in 42. Uh, Crane plays Rudolph early part of 42 to win the title. And then in December, they had their annual tournament. And Willie wins. I think he went 9-0. and He just killed everybody. The next time he loses is 1946. He challenges Crane, wins the title back in 46. And the next time he loses in 55, loses and wins the title back in 55. In 56, in Kingston, North Carolina, when they're, they're now playing on a five, on a four and a half by nine, they abandoned the five by ten in 1950. Willie has the, the last game of the tournament. Willie does 14 and 0. A double round robin. 14 and 0. The last game of the tournament he's playing Jimmy Moore. Jimmy breaks the balls. Willie runs 150 and out. The first recorded 150 and out in World Tournament play. Hmm. He gets a stroke in 1957. Comes back in 58 and takes the best four players of the year, which were Karras, Crane, Lassiter, and Jimmy Moore. And puts, gets sponsorship and they're going to play for an invitational world title. Karras backs out at the last minute. And Willie had a stroke about four or five months early and comes back and wins the title again, which a lot of people don't even know that that tournament took place. He goes into retirement from 58 to 66. They lure him out of, out of retirement in 66 by offering him $10,000 and whatever he won under in the tournament, with all expenses paid. 66 years old, out of competition for eight years. He finishes second to Joe Balsas. He goes 14 and three, Balsas was 15 and two. And everybody's saying, oh, he had to play all lamb chops. Really? But well, when you're playing a, a 21-man round robin, you play the lamb chops, but you play the Lions also. And he loses three games. I think he loses to Cicero Murphy, Crane, and the bosses. <coughs> Those were three losses. He beat everybody else in the corner, including Miserak. And Miserak, I said, Miss, how did you feel playing Willie? He says, I shook so bad, I think I knocked the table off level. <laughs> So, Charlie, let me ask you a question. There's been a lot of conversation, which this is really about, about this 526 ball run of Willie's. And some people praise it tremendously. And there's always going to be naysayers that say it wasn't that great a feat because of the size of the table, the size of the pockets, uh, the players today. What's your thoughts on this? I'm going to go back to something the great ball of Nelson Burton Jr. once said, once said on the wide world of sports. He says, they asked him what's the difference between a professional, a good amateur, and, a, and, and just a poor bowler. And his answer was this. A poor bowler does things well some of the time. A good semi-pro does things well most of the time. And a professional does the same thing the same way every time. And he has to adjust. My comment is, if you're a true professional, just like Raymond Kuhlman, maybe the greatest three cushion player ever, said, a professional learns how to adjust. Really how to adjust his game for a four by eight table on five whatever inch pockets there were, with whatever cloth was there, coming in off the road. He didn't play on the table for hours and hours. I know his routine. He would come in a half hour early. And this is a story which substantiates what I'm saying. He was going to play at Olington Biggins, which was owned by Gene Belukas' dad, Al Belukas, and at the, thing, at the time, I think, Frank McGowan. And they hired Willie really to do an exhibition. And Willie's going to play this guy, which I really, never knew his real name, Tony Meatballs. And guys are going to laugh, but they probably know who he was. He was a decent house player. And Cicero Murphy, Al Lucas, and Frank McGowan told me the same story. 
But since Leo was really good friends with Tony Meatball, and he says he's watching Tony for like three months ahead of time run balls. He's running hundreds, 150, 200, 100, 180, 140. And Tony's like in bed stuff. He's ready to barbecue Willie. Willie's routine was he came in a couple of hours early, drove there from Jersey, parked his car, had a pearl and an alarm clock in his car. He gets up about 45 minutes before the match, goes into the pool room, I guess goes to the bathroom, washes his face and hands, sits down, eats something light, practices for 15 minutes. They lag for the break. Tony Meatball gets within, this is according to Cicero Murphy, a quarter of an inch in the bottom rail. Really freezes the ball on the rail. Tony breaks the rack. Legitimate safety. Willie runs 150 and out from the break. Tony is devastated. Cicero goes up to Tony and says, Tony, all those months you've been practicing running balls, you should have been practicing the leg. <laughs> there you go. So I know Willie's routine, and I watch them practice with facts. You go in, hit maybe three, four racks of balls, practice a few bank shots, practice a few stop shots, and he was done. He had a routine that he used with stop shots. He would put the balls maybe two feet apart to start and pocket the ball in the corner pocket, stop the cue ball. Then he kept spreading out the distance between the object ball and the cue ball. And that, that was one of his routines. When he did that, that was it. He was done. When he was happy with his performance, tried a few banks, tested the rails, he was done. I don't think I saw him warm up for more in, in the years that I was around him, from 77 to 92. I don't think I saw him practice more than 20 minutes at a time, except this one time when he was really trying to get in stroke when we were in Vegas. But, I mean, my thing is, the guys that are questioning Willie and knocking him, what did you ever do? Well, who did you ever be? What's your high run? And how many times did you do it? Running 100 once or 150 once don't make you a great player. Running it every 11 games, you're a hell of a player. You're really must own. Other than that, you're just a good player that got lucky once. Who did you beat? Some boat from a local pool room for $50? Get locked in a room at the time with the late Steve Miserak, with Crane, with Lassiter, with Petey Margo, Alan Hopkins. Play them tournament upon tournament upon tournament and tell me how many you win. And that gives me another statistic, Billy, which floored me until I did the research. The great Luther Lassiter, which had to be one of the best nine ball, one pocket, straight pool, all round players in the world. He was. How many times do you think he played really? I mean, how many times did he beat Willie from 1952 to 1966? I have no, no idea. None. Zero. Do you know how impossible that is? Luke the last of the getting beat every time? Uh, I mean, is that impossible? It's an accomplishment. Okay. I mean, it, it's like saying, how many times did Jake Schaefer Jr.? Be happy. None. <laughs> yeah. You know, beats every other living human. When he played happy, you should know this. Yeah. He sure. played happy, it was like, you know, what happened? Did they get amnesia? Went into a coma. Yeah, they get into a coma, they get locked stroke. They think they're playing ping pong. Well, Charlie, I hope our conversation here will shed some light with your highly educated uh, knowledge about Willie's career and his accomplishments and will help sort of settle to some degree the debate about this high run and what his capabilities were then or what they would be today or how we would fare against today's players or them against uh, the older players. Uh, okay. That was the Anything purpose of this. I'm going to make a statement. You tell me any sport in existence today, any sport, name a champion 
that in 17 years of competition, won 15 of the world titles. The great Tiger Woods did not dominate for 15 of 17 years. Probably Raymond Kuhlman's the only one I can think of. It'd be pretty close, if not equaled. Well, I know that, that the, the only one of the only losses he had was uh, Kobayashi. Is that right? I'm saying that right. Kobayashi, yeah. Kobayashi beat him, I think, in '74. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure of the year, but I. But I, for I, many I years, he he went right. undefeated. Major upset. Yeah. I mean, he was like odds-on favorite. Yeah. But, I mean, think about boxing. Joe Lewis didn't dominate 15 or 17 years. Sugar Ray Robinson didn't dominate 15. Uh, Rocky Marciano didn't dominate. Sugar Ray Leonard didn't dominate. Ali didn't dominate. Go to golf. Ben Hogan did not dominate. Arnold Palmer. Jack Nicklaus. Look at it. Any sport. Baseball. Did any player in baseball, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, dominate 15 or 17 years? As best average? No. A football team. If a football team ever won 15 of 17 World Super Bowls, okay, they don't be drug tested. <laughs> now, I'm not taking anything away from the players today. Even F. N. Reyes, was, when he came up, he was unbeatable. He didn't last 15 years. Once they put the first kink in his arm, everybody started firing at him. Siegel. Miserac, Wempy, go down the line, Hopkins. Nobody dominated. Yeah. But it, it's just, he, he was, I don't know if you want to say he was a freak, he was unique. God gave one man more ability than everyone else. In any sport, I don't care what it is. One guy stands out. I have friends of mine, you know, I came out of the shooting industry. that are just phenomenal. Like, they never miss. And, and it's, why? Why did God pick him? I don't know. But they all pay their dues. And the only thing I can tell is the young players keep playing. Unfortunately, there's no money in the game. You know, money is a great motivator. Today, you know, they, they, they could be the greatest shooter. They could run 30,000 balls without a miss. And they, they can't make a living, which is unfortunate. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I mean, you know, this would be cushion. Yeah. You know, the United States, a three-cushion player, you might as well go on, you know, uh, welfare. Because you ain't going to make a dime. As far as tournaments go, anyway. <laughs> yeah, tournaments go. I mean, you know, money players are money players. You know, right. There was always money players. I got interviewed one time on the, the re-release of The Hustler in, I think, 2002 or 2004, whenever it came out. And they say, when do you think The Hustle started? I says, on day one. <laughs> Two guys are in a room. One guy thinks he's better than the other. You know, and he's going to try to put a move on the other guy. Let's be realistic. Today, these poor guys in tournaments, as rare as they are, uh, the U.S. National Three Cushion Tournament. I think if you win, you get 4000 It costs you 1500 to go there. And unless you have a sponsor, you're in the minus. Figure what it costs you all year long to practice. What, what are you going to make? It's probably a break even at best, you know. And then when you figure the time and effort you got to put into learning the game, I mean, you know as well as anybody, you play, you finish second in the world for, in the, in the nationals. You know, you, you can't make a living. That's why I went the other route my whole life. You know that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, gambling was the only issue. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's five. Survival makes you do whatever you need That's to do right. to survive. You're right. It's um. You know, the guys who think Willie did great, God bless you. He did great. The guys who think that Willie wasn't so great, they're assholes. It's plain English. You know, I, I don't mean to be vulgar about it, but you know something? What did you do to, to even question what this man did? What are your accomplishments? You ran a rack or two? Once you ran 100, maybe you ran 150, maybe you ran 200 once in your life? Get up there every week and go out and entertain people. They expect you to run 150. They expect you to never miss a trick shot. They expect you to be the best in the world, and you have to walk in and be it. Plus, the man was a gentleman. He was meticulously dressed. The players today need etiquette lessons. They need to be dressed. They need to know how to act in front of people and how to represent the game that you're supposedly representing. 
there's, a, there's enough of bad stigmas attached to the game without them personifying it. And that's what they should concentrate on. Rather than knocking somebody, why don't you better the game? Better yourself. That's what I like about three cushion. I mean, I'm sure that they gamble and there's low wives in it and sneaky guys and whatever, however you want to do it. But when they walk into a tournament, they're all dressed to match them. You know this. I watch you guys. Yeah. Yes. You come in with vests, tuxedo shirts, bow ties. You know, okay, that's a different sport. It's a gentleman's game. Pool is, is, is an everyday man's game. But it doesn't mean you have to drag it down lower. Build it up. Then maybe you can get corporate sponsorship and you can make a living at it. But anyway, that's what I have to say. Whoever liked what I said, thank you. Whoever don't like it, I really don't give a shit. <laughs> Charlie, I want to appreciate you talking with me on this subject. I'm going to try and post most of it <laughs> on the forum. Uh, we'll